Okay, so my mission for this part is to talk to you about active learning and a sense of some things which we do when we try and do that. Okay? And um, yesterday, with the high school class of about 30 students, we had a really good time <coughs> making them role play. So I had a group of children sitting at different heights, representing the feudal system in medieval England. There's king, and barons, and the landowners, and then lots of peasants being made to sit on the floor, thinking about how you represent something physically. And then we fought the Battle of Hastings. We had a, a storytelling activity where they represented the different groups who wanted to be in charge of England. And one of the things which we try and do in Europe is to share best practice. So we were talking just with, with that group about this is the way that we sometimes teach in England or in Russian Federation or in Bosnia or Herzegovina. And my mission then is to spend a little bit of time talking about what we do with that and then to hand over to the other two colleagues to give you different examples. What we try and do, and you don't need to read all of the text, is to base what we do on evidence of what works. So very much a sort of socially constructed sense of learning, that talking to each other and physically doing things helps you remember it. And I know your curriculum is very knowledge rich. And we think we have things to learn maybe from you about how we make that better in our curriculum. But our curriculum is very skills rich. So there is a balance to learn from each other. Uh, a lot of what we try and do, therefore, makes the children do things. Quite a lot of work for the teacher to set that up. But actually very rewarding when the children then take over and are empowered to do things. And the theory says that it's also much more memorable that they will remember those active things for longer and more deeply. So we ended up with a lot of dead bodies yesterday in the classroom. By the end, of course, nobody was dead because I get into big trouble if I kill too many people. But they were reenacting the battle. And in the second part of the session, we had a decision-making activity jumped 200 years, and they had to be the British forces fighting the French. Seems to go on all through history, British fighting the French, still happening. And they had to decide what they would do. And some of them were victorious and chivalrous. They were very medieval. And some of them ended up dead because they managed their forces very badly and they were defeated. And some of them ended up as war criminals because they made a decision partway through the game to execute prisoners. And in a medieval sense, that would have been okay if it was all good people, <coughs> but it was very, very bad if you were executing nobles, partly for chivalrous reasons, partly because you could make money out of that. So it's a good opportunity to think about how medieval people fought, and have some fun, and do something active, and spend some time thinking about how we are different to people in the past, and also how we're the same. You know, some ruthless medieval leaders would be fat and did what they did, and others would be more sure as following the code of the period. So, are you adding to your fish scales still? Is active learning something that you think is good history teaching? And I would guess in the room, some people think a little bit of that some people might want to have a lot more of that, and some people would be keen to have lots of active learning, and that's okay. But if you think it's a good feature of history teaching, add it. And if you think other things will be safe between the three of us are good, add those as well. When we talk about skills, we distinguish between first and second order concepts. I don't know if in Korean history teacher writing, history education writing. Do you have that as a notion? First and second order concepts of history? Yes, no? Okay, I'll explain the idea and then maybe, maybe you do, but maybe we call it something different here. So first order concepts is, is the, the body of knowledge of history. I think the dates, the facts, the 
names of the people, the substantial and substantive content. Okay, the things you can't really argue about. This is true, this is the date that this happened, these are the people here, that's the body of content, first order concept. And second order concepts are the more abstract ideas. Okay? The organizing or thematic ideas that make the discipline of history. So chronology, yes, first order concept. But the other things that make up history are the second order concept. <coughs> it's, a, it's a difficult idea. And they include these things on the list. I will read through them for you so that we can translate it. So chronology, the idea of time and how we break that up as a concept. The notion of evidence, handling using evidence from the past and some of the features of that evidence. So my colleagues yesterday were using cartoons or text sources or photographs and handling evidence is a conceptual process with its own body of operation as part of what makes history and history teaching. The idea of cause and consequence, what makes things happen? What are the results of that? And studying the trends in that over time. Maybe looking at war, or maybe looking at chance, or the role of the individual, the factors that make things happen. Technology, religion, ideas. Yeah? So there's a lot of academic writing around these notions and the teaching of them as part of history teaching. Interpretation, the fact that you might have something in your history book, it might be told in a different way in Britain, Hollywood films might have another completely different and probably less historical interpretation, and then somebody else might have another way again. So interpretation as a notion is historiography. Sometimes the story changes because of the way that a particular period looks at it. Colonialism is looked at in a particular way. As time goes on, maybe there's reinterpretation or revisionism and interpretation changes. Sorry, jump. Significance, why things are important. And, and we deal with that all the time. What do you include in your teaching? What do you choose to leave out? What is significant? What is less significant? What would be significant if you live in a particular place or a particular country? And maybe, again, these are fish scales. These concepts are things that you would like your children, your young people, your trainee teachers maybe, to be aware of and to think about the features and the nature of our subject. Empathy, really problematic concept in the UK because it's not the same as sympathy. Some of our newspapers go absolutely crazy about the notion that you could have empathy for Hitler in 1930s Nazi Germany. Well, of course, empathy isn't sympathy. They're different. Yeah? You're not approving of what he did. You're trying to understand why. And then you can make a moral judgment about aspects of it being wrong. But being able to look at the structure of why decisions were made, what were the motivations, very, very important. And diversity. We have got better in our curriculum at looking at women's history. We are not good at it yet. Half the population, mostly ignored in the textbooks, and that is something we still need to copy, uh, so, sorry to deal with. My interest partly is in minorities in textbooks, some of my research is about that. We're not good at that, but we got better at that. So in terms of the representation of some of those groups, it can still be tied to particular narratives, but diversity very, very important in the increasingly globalized world where people have to manage to get along with each other. And we talked about earlier evidence-based approaches to teaching. This, this is American research, it's a little bit dated now, but it suggests that more is remembered if you are active. 
Okay, so the bottom of the pyramid is talking about, which is why I made you talk to each other, I tried. Doing and showing other people. So hopefully, some of the stuff I did yesterday on the two medieval battles, those young people will remember because it's a different way of doing it and they will have had to talk to each other and then do things and move around in aesthetic learning. Okay? And of course, what it says is that lectures is the least effective. And at this point, you should be thinking, then why are you lecturing as a dean? Why are you talking to us if you're saying that it's the least effective? And of course, actually, you're very good at using any of those. But young people, perhaps in some cultures, less good. Here, young people are used to being told things, and that's okay, but maybe shake it up a little bit with other ways of doing things. And then just some examples from some of the things we do. This is working in Cyprus with Cypriot teachers from the Turkish community and Cypriot teachers from the Greek-speaking community, so across the two sides of the divided island, and it's reconciliation work. And we are doing some women's history, and they are pinning events onto a washing line, and they're deciding which things were most important. Okay, so they have to talk about it, they have to agree it, and they have to put them in some sort of sequence, and then they have to justify it to other people. It's a different way of dealing with lots of different things and thinking about which one is most significant, what happens at which dates. Yesterday, I was fighting battles with your students while they were fighting each other, and very successful they were too. Yeah? Looking at change, so maybe some role play. We used tabards, we used things to put around them, giving them a role so they knew what the other characters were. And we made, or well, they made props, they made some swords, they made some axes, they had to be sort of tough Viking warriors, or English archers, or Norman knights. And we managed to think about what happened and why. We worked through some of the ideas about change. Some of my student teachers dressed up they were working with 100 secondary school children, learning about the 1940s, and they did it in costume. And they ran workshops for the children, picking up on rationing, or on how life was different for children during the war, or on what happened during air raids. And we looked at life in Britain, 1939 to 45, on training day. And then our primary training teachers, the people who work for younger children, did the same idea with 200 primary children. I try and hide at that point. Primary children aren't really my first choice. Okay? And they did storytelling, and they did wartime cookery, and they made little model toys, because children who had been bombed out of their homes had nothing, so people made cheap toys for them. And we were able to introduce lots of content about the war and have a nice time. And at this school, we'd dress them up. Evidence, this is another one of my trainee teachers. Do you recognize the character? Sherlock Holmes? Talking about evidence for the past. This is him in a lesson I was observing. I have to, I have to check that he meets the national standards. And there he is, dressed as Sherlock Holmes, talking to his class about evidence. Interpretation we've talked about already. So hopefully your fish is beginning to have a little bit more meat on it. A little bit more fish. Yeah. Sometimes we use technology. This is the Battle of Agincourt, but done as a stop motion activity with Playmobil men. So you take a picture. Then you move the figure, and you take a picture, and you move the figure. Yeah, you get the idea? And then they put, they put a soundtrack with it, and then everybody laughs at each other's bit of work because the figures move around a little bit strangely, but it's great fun. Really nice after school activity because it takes a long time. Different ways of looking at 
multi-perspectivity. So we make the film, and then they make a soundtrack from France. And you have the French version of the story. The terrible defeat of the brave French soldiers by the very tricky English. Or they do the English version, an amazing victory despite the weather, our brave boys. Or they maybe do a Hollywood version where America wins the battle, even though America wasn't involved. Because Hollywood, the Americans always win, even if they're not there. Sometimes it might be very modern things, 20th century history, thinking about empathy. This is our prime minister in the middle. He thought he'd prevented a world war. Poor man, history now looks at him as a disaster just beginning to be reinterpreted that he was doing the right thing but with disastrous consequences so we look at interpretation so lots and lots of different ways of being active and getting that sense of multi-perspectivity and doing things that as an organization we think are very very important and my guess is you've had enough of me so i'm going to ask my better looking and cleverer colleagues to come and do their part. Okay, so I look forward to your questions later, and then I'm going to check what you've got written to make sure that your fish has got lots of ideas on it.